Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, Wazi Hanska. Um, I'm the Senior Managing Director for the Native Alliance at Teach for America. And I've been in this role for uh, be 10 years this uh, coming summer. And prior to uh, being on, on staff, I was a high school teacher, social studies, Lakota history, culture, um, and also high school principal uh, for many years. And um, today I wanted to share um, a really important part of our culture as Northern Plains tribes and as an Oglala, you know, I know there's a lot of like, maybe a little bit of confusion because um, a lot of us that have, you know, in, in school didn't really study a lot about indigenous people in the tribes. Um, there's 375 federally recognized tribes in the lower 48 plus another 200 Alaska Native villages, and then also the indigenous Native Hawaiians among the islands um, that are all uh, indigenous um, citizens of what became the United States. And so just the diversity of having so many different tribes, um, you know, an estimated of over 300 languages prior to uh, Columbus, um, and the Spanish conquistadors coming over. Um, today, we have less than 200 uh, indigenous languages. So it's, it's something that a lot of our communities and tribes are really working to ensure that we have our indigenous languages that connect us to our ancestors and ceremonies and culture, history, all of those things are so important. Um, today, I wanted to um, share a, um, I, I guess a storytelling about the uh, Plains Indian teepee. And teepee is actually a word that's taken from our language in Lakota. Um, it, it literally trans, translates to like dwelling and, or home. And so <clears throat> the teepees um, of the Plains tribes were, I, I don't think there's even really, uh, a true documentation of how how long you, our, our people have utilized teepees as our home and our shelters. Um, there's places in uh, Wyoming, Montana, even into Canada, as far south as um, into uh, Arizona, New Mexico, where archaeologists have un uncovered like what's called teepee rings. And teepee rings are, were uh, arch, uh, archaeological sites where there would be medium-sized, pretty heavy stones that would be laid out in a circle. And what that determined was at one time, there were uh, tribes that were nomadic and hunted the buffalo. The buffalo for um, our shelters and for a lot of the different um, resources that people depended on, you know, clothing and and um, the keeping the the robes to keep warm. The actually the hide, the teepee covers were made of buffalo hides, and so they're estimating that there have been teepees and utilization of teepees that go back at least ten thousand years, and so um, and that really uh, talks about you know how important you know, that type of lifestyle was because our tribe, the Oglalas were, like I said, very nomadic, uh, move camp um, very often because they were dependent on hunting and, you know, buffalo and deer and elk. So the camp would always break and move to different places. So the practicality of teepees were, was really important that they were a structure that was uh, very, you know, um, sound architecturally. In other words, you know, that could stand up to high, you know, winds and storms, the extreme winters that happen, you know, during the, the winter and springtime. And so you needed something that was very, you know, architecturally sound that could withstand, you know, different elements of weather and conditions. And really, uh, people have 
uh, as they studied the teepees really have marveled at, you know, how they rival even the most advanced architectural designs and just the pract practicality of them uh, made them a very versatile um, home for people that were, you know, had to move and break camp in that. The earliest like written documentation of, of, of of teepees and the teepee rings were can be found is early in the uh, early 1500s by the Spanish conquistadors like Coronado and others that came up and uh, contacted uh, many of the different tribes and took documentation, drew pictures of the different shapes of the of the uh, northern plains and southern plains teepees. All of them are a little bit different in how they were put up and in the design. But I think the most uh, studied is the Plains, the Lakota Oglala style teepee, um, just because of, you know, our, our tribes have just historically been, you know, well-documented and known and uh, portrayed in different movies, the classic Westerns of the Calvary fighting the Indians, and just the history um, of our people is really well documented. Um, one of the like, um, I guess, firsthand accounts, written accounts of, you know, the different styles of teepees, um, how a little bit of their history, the construction and use, was documented by um, Reginald and Gladys Laban, and they were um, French um, immigrants that came over that just like early on in their life just had an incredible fascination with especially the Northern Plains tribes. And so in the early, like eight, late, late 1800s, early 1900s, they camped with a lot of like the Blackfoot, the, the, the Lakotas, the Northern Cheyenne, the Crows. They moved around and they camped and they made friends and they actually documented a lot of like the history and tradition. And in the 1950s, they, their writings were compiled into a book called the Indian Teepee. <laughs> and so uh, the, the Indian Teepee is, I would regard as probably one of the most accurate and well-documented uh, firsthand account of like the history of the teepees and how it how they compare different like styles of construction and use among the different tribes that they interacted and and lived with and they drew really uh, intricate patterns and designs um, that have been really important for like us today because a long time ago um, I'm gonna switch my screen around here so. Um, a long time ago, the, the, you know, people didn't have canvas. Like teepees today are made out of sewn, uh, really heavy duty canvas, uh, like tent, you know, the tent materials. And so as the design of the teepee, um, so the pattern and the canvas pattern were actually uh, taken from how the buffalo hides were uh, were sewn together. And so whenever they would go on, um, on hunts to, you know, provide food and shelter and all of the things that utilize all the different parts of the buffalo, I have to tell you that the true name of like my ancestors is actually called the buffalo people or the pate. Pate means buffalo and, and oyate means people. So the original like creation stories of the Lakota the places that below the wind cave and living as spirits and then eventually came out and became physical human beings and we're called the pateo yate because of our like use of the buffalo and we considered the buffalo like our closest uh, ancestor among the four-legged uh, uh, creations and living things so the buffalo hides when the buffalo were killed the women were responsible for 
um, taking the hides and going through a process called brain tanning, where they would string the hides up on, on a frame, and then they would scrape the hair and the muscle tissue and sinew where you would go down until you would have just the, the bare, like, um, uh, uh, par flesh of the, of, the, of the hide. And then they would go through a process called brain tanning where they would take parts of the brain and the liver, which had these different enzymes and compounds that would be rubbed into the hides. And then it would break down the fibers to make them soft so they're really hard, like rawhide. They would become really soft and pliable, like what, what you would call buckskin. And so it was intensive because each hide took about 18 hours to pair in order to get into the use of whether you were going to use them for a teepee or for a robe or whatever. So you would have hides that would have the hair on them or you would have hides that were completely stripped and, and, the, and the hair taken off. And then once once the hides were prepared uh, and brain tanned and, and made real soft and pliable, then they would build a fire and, and use like cedar or some type of hardwood that would create a lot of like thick smoke and they would put the hides over the smoke and then the smoke would be used to like weatherproof the hides. So if it, if it rained, the hides wouldn't turn back into raw hide and being real stiff and hard that the smoke would make them uh, so they would continue to stay, you know, pliable and in, 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 in and saying so like the uh, this kind of uh, average what would a precise tp look like back in the day this is a 14 foot diameter tp oh, so wow. you could imagine uh at the size of this tp would probably take about 10 to 14 buffalo hides and so each one of the hides would be sewn into this the the pattern that looks like this okay you see that pretty good yeah. All right. So, uh, so once once the, the 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 women would sew the hides, and they would use the sinew or the muscle tissue to for the thread, and then they would use an owl to poke holes in it. Then they would sew uh, the, the sinew and and sew the hides together, and then the men were responsible for uh, getting the teepee poles. And so the teepee poles um, were something that you would really look for is something that's real like the lodgepole pines that you find in maybe in the black hills or up in montana uh wyoming area those are ideal because they're really straight and they're really narrow and so but also very strong so once you peel the bark off them and the branches uh the teepee poles would look something they'd look like this and be very straight you know, so you want a really straight poles uh, once you're going to be putting up the teepee. And the one thing that, you know, that's important to know, too, about like these teepee poles, um, the, the, a lot of the, like the plains tribes, we never, horses are not indigenous to our, the North America. Mm -hmm. The Spaniards brought over horses from, from, from Europe. And, but prior to the horses, and this is dating back to like the 1600s, uh, when the Pueblos um, led by Pope, who was like a medicine man, a spiritual leader, he united the 19 Pueblos together and they revolted against the Spanish and basically chased them out of uh, what would be the borders of the United States into Mexico and and. And uh, so there was a big war, it's called the Pueblo Revolt. And, but historically what happened is the Pueblo Revolt was responsible for basically get, taking horses away from the Spaniards. And eventually by 1750, the horses made it up to the Northern Plains and our people became one of the greatest like riders of, of horses. But what, but what I'm getting at is prior to the horses, dogs were, were, were used by the people 
vehicles that would make travois. And these were used to haul uh, camps. So they were tied on the backs of the dogs. And then all the supplies would be put on the teepee poles. And then you would, you know, use them as travois to go to the next campsite. So teepee poles are, were really valuable. And they were used in trade purposes um, and really well taken care of because they were so hard to get, especially the ones that are really straight and, you know, and the, the right length. And so I'm going to, um, I'm going to turn the phone over to uh, my son and he's going to film me and I'm going to show you how the teepee was put up. Okay. Awesome. So the first thing, the first thing that you want to do is um, obviously the teepee is, is, uh, was our home, right? So it was, it, uh, the, you know, the women of the camp were responsible for getting the teepees ready, uh, putting the teepees up and ensuring that, you know, the camp was well organized and, and placed in, a, in, a, in like a strategic place. So uh, it would shield them from like the oncoming weather that would come or uh, a, a inner, inner war with other tribes or, or, or people that would come in and attack the camp. So the camps were always strategically put up and they were always put in a circle. And the camp sites were yeah, in the circle were always faced um, um, east. So the entrance of the teepee always faced east because the storms that would come into the plains usually come from the west, like the thunderstorms and that. So putting the teepees up in a way that uh, would make sure that they held up during, you know, strong weather or storms or anything like that was really important. And so, um, so knowing, no, so people knew how to put, how to put their teepees up really fast. And the reason that I got kind of interested in doing this was I was, I was early in my teaching career, I was out at Crow Creek and um, we, st I started like a, a celebration of, of, of American Indian week where we would really like immerse in different culture activities. And we like one, we would kill a Buffalo and, and, and cook the buffalo in a pit for the community. But one of the things I wanted to do was like have the teach the students how to put up teepees because uh, that was like a, something that was being lost. There wasn't a lot of people that actually knew how to put up a teepee because, you know, by 1900, the buffalo were almost extinct. Uh, people, you know, a lot of Native people were moved into what would be called like districts or different camps. And so they'd live in sod houses and, and later brick and, you know, mortar houses. And so the use of a teepee was really like lost for, for a few generations. And then uh, later, like in the 1960s, when some of the ceremonies like emerged from like being placed in underground because like the Sundance ceremony and other sacred ceremonies were forbidden by the federal government. And so a lot of those ceremonies were like hid underground and only practiced in secret because if you were out there practicing the ceremonies, you could be arrested and, you know, incarcerated in that. So it was, it, people were really scared to practice, you know, any type of ceremonies. And, and teepees were attributed to like uh, active resistance because they, you know, the government was trying to assimilate our people. They were trying to you know, force us to live at homes, to give up hunting buffalo and to be nomadic, to be like farmers and ranchers. And so that like that art of putting up teepees, I believe was was really, I wouldn't say lost, but there wasn't a lot of people that knew how to put them up. So in the early 90s, when I started doing the buffalo kill and and really thinking about, you know, doing a culturally based education and like decolonizing how we were doing and thinking about education. I wanted to like put up, start putting up teepees. So I went out there and I researched and I studied and I talked to older people and I finally like got enough of the skills to be able to be confident enough to go out and, you know, and get a teepee. And so me and my students from Crow Creek, we actually went on a field trip um, and Crow Creek is probably three hours from the Black Hills. And we went on a field trip all the way out here 
and got our own teepee poles. And so that was the beginning of me, like, you know, putting up pole, uh, teepees, teaching the students how to do it. And the, like, the style of how we put up teepees is so, like, it, it, it's incredibly efficient. Like, it only takes one or two people to put up a teepee. And sometimes I'll get, like, a little bit of a chuckle because I'll put, I'll watch people put up teepees in their style. And there's, like, 10 or 15 people putting them up and all holding poles and hanging on to the ropes and all, re like, really busy doing it. And I was thinking, you know, back in, the, back in the days when our people actually, you know, lived in teepees and used them, you, you couldn't afford to have that many people like engaged in putting up one teepee. There was just so much work to be done. And so the construction and design of them was so practical that once you like lift up the tripod, so like the Lakotas, the Oglalas, we had, we had these tripods. So once you lift up the tripod, ah. when, you lift it, when you lift up the tripod like this, then you start spreading out the poles. You spread out the poles. Whoa! Sorry. Usually I have one person helping me, but we'll get it. Sorry about that. No, this feels like a straight up like physics lesson and like or whatever math I, i'm not a math or physics teacher I like too yeah they, i mean definitely there's um you know math and everything that goes with it i just got to be quicker oh my gosh. When I lift them up. this is very impressive that's right have your dad out <laughs> okay you didn't see Ooh. that we'll edit that part out So now that's actually the hardest part. The hardest part. But you, can, but you can see that, you know, really one or two people easily can put up the tripod. And it's tied at the apex. <clears throat> and it's put up in a way where um, you don't have to, like, worry about it being too tight or too far apart once you start putting the other poles up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start putting up some poles. Oh my gosh! To, to make the frame, and so the first pole is what you call the door pole. So this is gonna be our door. Okay. So here's the entrance. All right. So, <clears throat> and you'll see how the design of the teepee the tripod is in a way that it's going to hold itself up mm -hmm. why i put the other poles up so you put each of these poles within the what you call the crutch right and i'm going to put one more Where did you get all, right, all your, how that, your poles? I, I, um, I, sometimes I'll go out and get them. Yeah. And sometimes I'll buy them from people. They're about $25 a pole. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. And then, so this is the next side. I'm, I'm, I'm putting up the other side of the, of the uh, frame. <clears throat> I was talking to Daphne and I, I was like, I can't even count the number of times I put up a TV and how many people I did demonstrations and showed them how to do it. Is 
is the 14 foot diameter that you mentioned, was that like a, a pretty like common yeah. size? Yeah. It, yeah, it was. Yeah. Because any bigger, it just took up too much resources and mm -hmm. you, you know, just practi practicality wise, you didn't need a really big teepee because they didn't have big, you know, big families back then. Mm -hmm. You can see how the poles just kind of all work and stay there. Beautiful. <clears throat> so um, I guess symbolize the symbolism, um, the poles represent like the womb, um, or, or the, the insides and the poles represent like the ribs. So there's, um, <clears throat> there's four, there's 12 pairs, 14 pairs of ribs, isn't there? Huh. Or is there 12 rib, 12 pairs? No idea. <laughs> for you aspiring physicians. <laughs> so what I'm doing now is I'm going to tie the poles together because we don't want them to like fall over. So I'm going to tie them at the middle and you go around clockwise for four rotations. And the, once again, the number of poles and how many times you go around is all like symbolic because uh, like for our tribe, the number four, the number seven, <clears throat> the number 14, 28, those are all like sacred numbers mm -hmm. and very symbolic. Yeah. Four and 40 and 400 and and all of those multiples are similarly important in Hawaii, <clears throat> which is the opposite. I'm Chinese, half Chinese, and it's like four is not a good number <laughs> in our culture, so it's been interesting. The, the shape of the teepee too, mm -hmm. as you can see, is oblong. It's not in a, it's not in a circle. Huh. Because the, because if it was in a circle, it wouldn't be as strong. Um, so the oblong shape creates more of a, a stable a frame. And then also having it cone shape or oblong shape like this um, helps with like the, like if you build a fire in it too. So you don't want the fire to smoke you out. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is it, you, need a, you need a good rope too. You need like a good manila type rope. Because you don't want a rope that's going to like slip. Mm -hmm. So this is a trick that I learned from a lot of the like research and uh, people teaching me how to, how to do this. This is called, you want to lock, what, what you're doing, what I'm going to do is lock the poles. And you do this by making a simple little not like here at the, uh, using one of your poles and then you take the the rope and you slip it over 
one of your poles. And what that does is it locks the, all the poles together in the rope. See that? Yep. So that way it won't come undone. And then the rope was then anchored, anchored on the teepee. They anchor it down so you would like stake it down so it wouldn't move around. So now we're ready to put the cover up. <clears throat> this is where you might need a little bit of help. The big cover. I imagine they were really heavy. Or no, the covers. Um, they, they can be, yeah, the hides were were pretty were pretty heavy and what you're doing here is you're going to fold the covers you got to make sure that it lays down on the outside uh, the inside is up mm -hmm. right so i'm going to drape the pp cover i'm going to ask did you make that or, or where did you get your cover uh, I got it from a, a place called Nomadic Teepee Makers. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Also, your your yard and the sky looks beautiful today. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very proud of our yard and our home. I put a lot of love in. Yeah. It's my kind of like my de-stress. Mm -hmm. my garden and the yard and planting and <clears throat> okay so I'm gonna see if I can bring this cover up And you put it in this little open spot in the center. Oh, wow. And what I'm gonna do now is just drape it, drape it around. <clears throat> you want to keep your flaps from being in the way. So once you have it draped, then you use dowels to pin it together. Do you want to get like a close up of this? So you insert the dowels oh. into the front and then twist it over and goes out the other side. Ah, so smart. How we do for time, yeah? Uh, it's you know, uh, 19 minutes. You're doing amazing. How many people would carry all of these things before? Like, how did they? How did they move all of this? They brought a travoy. Oh, and okay. Back then, a long time ago, dogs would pull them, and then later horses. So they use just like a, 
yeah. like a, um, yeah, they put the poles down and then they put the supplies on the poles. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just thinking about me. I'm five feet tall and trying to like <laughs> do the top one. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you what you, what they did is they tie a little. They put a um. You know, there was no chairs, right? So yeah. they would put a um. Tie a rope. I mean, a rope. Um. Like a teepee pole, and they'd use it for like a step ladder. Yeah. And tie it on the poles. This teepee doesn't get put up very often, so it's real stiff. Here we go. Plus my shoulders. So you want to lace each one of these pins. It's better to have the dowels have a little sharpened point too, kind of like a uh, pencil, so mm -hmm. it goes in, goes in easier. So now it's tall enough. I mean, I'm tall enough. We don't need to stand on anything. <laughs> I don't want to go flipping and falling off a chair and end up in no, emergency here. So after this is over and we have this video, when we put our, when we gather for our next Native Alliance Summit, you guys will have to all put up the teepee. Oh, <laughs> I didn't, I couldn't make it to uh, the east side this year, but we'll see how it works in the coming year. I, I feel like I would have to practice a lot. I'm not necessarily like <laughs> super fast. It's easy. <laughs> it's easy when you get the kind of the hang of it. Yeah. I've been doing these so many, so much. That's gorgeous. Over the, over the years. Um, so I just got these bottom ones to let you have to do for the front. Do you see how that how I'm doing it? Mm -hmm. Go through the inch one, the same. Go out the bottom and then come out the top. Yep. So oh, ingenious. Yeah, it, I mean, it. Um, it was a a structure and a home. Like I said, that dates back ten thousand years or long or older, you know, with people that <clears throat> needed to, you know, that weren't sedentary or, you know, there's a lot of tribes that that had permanent structures, you know, like in the in the northeast, the uh, the longhouses, mm -hmm. or you know, up north you had igloos and different structures, and. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go inside and stretch it out so it, it looks nice on the bottom. So I'm moving my poles out. The tripod poles, you're not going to be able to move. Once, once they're there, they're there. <laughs> yeah. But the other poles you can stretch, stretch out. I'm really, um, I put a lot of pride into putting up teepees because I, you know, they were our homes. And so I want them to, I want them to look nice. And so I put a lot of like TLC into my teepee constructions. And <clears throat> on the bottom, 
you see like these pegs, I mean these loopholes, like yeah. right here. So a long time ago, <clears throat> remember when I talked about the teepee rings, those rocks? So they would put the, make the covers longer and then they would weigh them down to the rocks. But later they would use these uh, dowels and then they would stake them down like this. Okay, and yeah. all the way around. And that holds the cover to the ground so it doesn't uh, come up. So I'm gonna put the smoke flaps. <clears throat> the smoke flaps are really important because the design of the teepee, you wanted to make sure that, you know, if the fire was going or if it was raining, that you didn't get wet inside. So the smoke flaps we could be you could be moved around. So I'm putting the smoke flaps up. And depending on the direction of the wind or the rain, you would you could open or close your smoke flaps. Get this part over here. See, I'm putting it in there. Mm -hmm. There you go. Nice. And then they form a X on the back. And there you have it, the Lakota style teepee. Let's go inside and show them the, I'll show you the inside here. Remember that cup, that, that picture I got of me sitting in that teepee? That's what that looks yeah. like. And so <clears throat> the hides, when you would have a fire in here, the hide in this canvas is kind of translucent. So they would take other, they would take hides and make what would be called a liner. And the liner would be hung up and tied to the poles all the way around. And that would provide you uh, a little bit of like privacy, but also it was practical because with a liner, whenever it rained and the, like the smoke flaps were closed in the front, the water would drizzle down the poles between the cover and the liner mm -hmm. and go out the bottom. And so it would stay completely dry nice. inside your teepee. And the fire was always put right straight down from where I would have this rope. This is where we would build our fire. And then <clears throat> you, you would build the fire in a way that the smoke would go straight out and out the flaps. And so that kept the teepee nice and warm with the liner. Um, and then uh, you would close the covers. I'll show you what I mean by closing the smoke flap. Let's say it's gonna, it's gonna rain from one side. So basically you just take your smoke flap <laughs> See? Yeah. Or if the wind came from the other way, you would do the opposite. Do you, do, do you guys have any questions? We only have a few minutes left. Natalie Madison, feel free. I've been asking a bunch of questions as we go. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, I'm glad. 
I'm 61. I'm a little winded, but doing pretty good. I was going to say, that is, uh, Natalie just wrote, um, Natalie, he can't see the chat because he's on his phone, but she just uh, wrote that it's an amazing design. And it's pretty incredible that we can watch this on Zoom. And yeah. Um, Sorry, I can, I can I can voice something over too. I um I'm always curious about pretty much everything. <laughs> how, but like how did people figure this out? Like how did people figure out that this was the design? I mean, are there any stories about how this design came about or anything like that? I mean, I well, I think every every design, like from artwork to you know, the structures or your weapons or whatever, there's, there's always stories attached to it. And I think, you know, our, like the creation story of the Oglala and the, like the Lakota speaking people came from within the Black Hills of Spirits, remember? And then they came out, uh, were basically tricked out of coming out as spirits and became human beings and were cold and starving. And as they wandered, um, one of the spirits and the spirit it was called wazi and that remember my indian name is wazi hanska it means pine uh, one of the like the old spirits within the black hills are the pines and so the pines the wazi and other spirits help the first people uh tokahe and his family the way of um utilizing the buffalo and so the buffalo at that time, they could communicate with the people. And through that relationship, the buffalo sacrificed themselves in order for the people to live, like gave up, gave up their lives for our people. And you know, through that sacrifice, the teachings of how to like provide for that shelter, that warrant for that protection was made during that time. And so the creation story is tied to the teepee because the, like the cover is made of the buffalo hides, the poles are made of wazi, the pine. The, the number of poles represent the ribs within the woman's body. The structure represents the womb. Um, all of the, the, when you see the, 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 oh, no. with a t the poles the poles at the top like if you were to flip it over it would it would match like it's like an hourglass and so the poles at the top represent the skies the spirit of the sky and the pole and the poles on the bottom represent the connection to Uchi Makar, mother earth and so the middle part is the connection between the earth and the sky and so there's, so all of this has like a symbolism of how they were able to do it. And I think a lot of it came through, you know, visions and prayers. And, you know, I have to tell you that, you know, indigenous people in what would be called West, there are signs like if you look at the civilizations of the Aztecs and the Incas, the Mayas, the Kiokia, which is the, the mound builders that were like in St. Louis and that, mm -hmm. their architecture and design was far ahead of European. Like when the Europeans were getting sick with bubonic plague because of the, the way that they're the sewage and the rats and all of that, we never had those diseases and sicknesses because we were aware of the connection to Unchimaka and the earth and the water. We had like aqua systems that were built that, that carried water to uh, irrigate our fields, like, you know, corn and potatoes and tomatoes and beans, all of those are indigenous to our people. So the, the, the advancements of, of our societies far, were far more advanced than Europeans. The Europeans just lucked out and got guns first, right? And that changed the whole tide of, of warfare because we didn't have access to the guns. But when our people had guns, we're 
undefeatable. Like the Lakotas were never ever defeated in a military confrontation with the soldiers. And so, but I think the connection to the spirits, because the Lakotas are all like indigenous people. We believe everything has life. Like these poles have life, these trees, the grass, the winds, everything has life and spirits connected with it. So that connection makes you like a steward and a protector of those resources because once those resources were depleted, then life ceases to exist. And so that's why, you know, like with our people, we're hunters and gatherers, we didn't garden, but today we're learning how to garden. We're learning about food sovereignty because we know very well about food deserts, food sovereignty, those who control the food and the water control the people. So that's why getting back to learning how to like be more self-sufficient and being able to like take care of stuff, you know, like if I lose my job and, and lose our house, we got this teepee to live in. Josh, <laughs> that'll be tough, but we, we would, we'd have to do what we'd have to do, right? Thank you. This is beautiful. Yeah. Also, I just wanted to share a lovely little moment. So right when you had the um, camera on your screen and a breeze kind of came through your yard and moved the tree, it was really nice because a breeze came through down the mountain over here and blew through my house. And it, I was like, oh. And then I was like, wait, we're in two entirely different spaces. But it was a nice. Um, that's gorgeous. Yeah, I put it in my front yard. Uh, when my wife, when Daphne was on the school board and when she uh, fulfilled her term and then, you know, she wasn't, she didn't get reelected, but we put up the teepee in the front yard and had a dinner to honor her. And uh, our, there were a lot of complaints from the neighbors about how come these Indians have this teepee up? We want it down. And oh, so we got into a little conflict about the right to put up a teepee. And I said, you know, <clears throat> I see tents in people's yards. Right. You know, what's the difference? And so the councilman said, well, you could keep it. And I said, well, I, we were only planning on keeping it up for a few days. So it's not like it's going to be a permanent, permanent structure. But nowadays when I put it up, I just put it up in the back yard so I don't hear this with you. I, I you know, the, the beauty of our teepees and the cultural significance of them and, you know, like I said, today, it's an act of resistance. It's yeah. an act of decolonization. It's an act of indigenizing who we are and to be proud of, you know, where we came from, right? And where we're going today. So we put up teepees at high school graduations. We honor our graduates with eagle feathers. We have ceremonies for, for our people. Um, you know, there's a lot of tribes that have coming of age ceremonies for the transition of when a, a young girl becomes a woman and one of part of that ceremony is that they put up a teepee they stay in the teepee over a period of several days and then once they came up come out with their grandma or their mothers and make that like reintroduction into the community and the tribe as a young as a young woman and then the teepee is taken back down and then you know so there, you know, the symbolism uh, behind it is so important. Um, and even the, like, the Standing Rock, what happened with the water protectors in Standing Rock, the teepees was one of the, the symbols of resistance. It was the symbol of water as life. And many of the, act, the young activists, when they would go in and they would, um, you know, go into public, um, you know, offices or banks or even congressional people, one of the things that they did is they carried in their teepee and they set up the teepee in the lobby or in the entrance of it. And so this is definitely an act of, you know, of decolonizing. It's an act of resisting that uh, movement towards assimilation, termination, the genocide of our language and our culture. And we're going to forever be here. And this is the symbol of that, of that resistance. So I want to thank all of you for being on the call. Thank you for, you know, um, giving me the honor to, you know, be the storyteller this week.
Um, it was like, I, I'm a little rusty from putting up a teepee, uh, but uh, I'm glad I was able to share it with you. And hopefully we can have a recording because I think it'd be cool to have it kind of archived too. We have it. I hope. Cool. <laughs> All righty. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank okay. you. It, it takes me about 10 minutes to take it down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you.